My name is Andrew Carl. I'm a professor here in the history department and the Department of African, African American and African Studies. Um, and uh, before I introduce the person who's going to introduce our speaker for this evening, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, our event tonight, which is co sponsored by the uh, Corporate Department of History, the Program in American Studies, uh, the Carter G. Woodson Institute, and the uh, Power, Violence, and Inequality Collective. So it's truly really a sort of group endeavor here this evening. Um, and also, I should mention, um, if you haven't already, please silence your cell phones. And um, last but not least, there will be copies of uh, Professor McLean's excellent book here for sale um, afterward, and um, should be available to sign copies as well. So uh, right back in the uh, back corner there, if um, you wanted to pick up a copy after the talk this evening. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to um, Joey Thompson, our um, history grad student here, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Thanks to everyone for coming out tonight, and thanks to Professor Carl and um, all the folks who made this event possible. Our speaker tonight, Professor Nancy McLean, comes to us from just down the road at Duke University, where she's the William H. Chase Professor of History and Public Policy. She's the author of five books, numerous essays and articles, and the immediate past president of the Labor and Working Class History Association. Her first book, Behind the Mask of Chivalry, The Making of the Second Ku Klux Klan, used a case study of the Athens, Georgia chapter of the KKK to analyze the mixture of nativism, economic individualism, Protestant Christianity, and white supremacy that propelled this terrorist group to power in the 19-teens and 20s. This work won the James A. Rowley Prize in 1995 from the Organization of American Historians for the best book dealing with the history of race relations in the United States. And if this topic sounds relevant to our contemporary moment, it should. In March, in March of this year, Slate published an excerpt from this work to help contextualize recent white supremacist terrorism and fascism in the United States. In 2006, she published Freedom is Not Enough, the opening of the American Workplace, which charted the story of how grassroots efforts by African Americans, Mexican Americans, and white women, as well as the passage of the Civil Rights Act, broke down the culture of exclusion in, in places of employment. This book earned her the Philip Taft Labor History Award, the Lillian Smith Book Award, and the Willard Hurst Prize. But what brings her here tonight is her most recent publication, Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Rights Stealth Plan for America, a work that offers a model of how to make the study of history intellectually rigorous, emotionally compelling, and politically necessary. This book traces the intellectual and institutional networks that connected political economist James McGill Buchanan, the massive resistance campaign against school desegregation, public choice theory, the Koch brothers, and the current political efforts to undermine our democracy. Just last week, the National Book Foundation announced the inclusion of Democracy in Chains as a finalist for the National Book Award in Nonfiction. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nancy. Thank you so much, Joey, for that uh, generous introduction. And I have to tell you, keep your eyes on this guy. We had a wonderful talk at the LACHA conference this, uh, what was it, in June, about the dissertation that Joey is writing. And it's just absolutely fascinating. It's going to light up the world. So really, really. Uh delighted to have you do the introduction. I am also really pleased to be here uh, talking with you all tonight. I have been at UVA many times for research. I was here once as a, what, what do they call them, the dream, dream mentors or something for the Miller uh, Center uh, uh, dissertation program. And uh, it just feels really good to be back here with you now. Um, and I uh, thought that maybe because my book has a lot of local history in it um, about UVA, I, I might start with a brief reading uh, before I get into the talk. And then we'll see how things play out. If there's time after the questions and discussions, then I might tell you a story about how the operation that was based at uh, um, uh, UVA ran aground in later years as the state democratized. I think that might be kind of inspiring for our, our current moment here. Uh, but OK, so this is an early early uh, part of the story. Um, uh, it was the chance of a lifetime. The university founded by Thomas Jefferson himself was giving the new chair of the economics department full reign to create a kind of program that existed nowhere else. At a time when the discipline of economics, in James Buchanan's words, threatened to become extremely boring, his new employer entrusted him to chart a new course. 
The private mission statement of the Thomas Jefferson Center for Political Economy and Social Philosophy that Buchanan submitted to University President Colgate Darden in December 1956 made a lot of promises. It promised to be guided by two traditions, that of the old-fashioned, a lot of this is quotation, uh, the old-fashioned libertarians whose ideas encouraged laissez-faire economic policies in 19th century uh, England and America, and that of the Western conservatives who feared the revolt of the masses, as the title of a text on Buchanan's uh, reading list put it. The document also made clear, and this is a quote, who would not be allowed to participate, end quote. Anyone who would value security, which was the mantra of the New Deal, above liberty, and who would, quote, replace the role of the individual and the voluntary organization by the coercive powers of the collective order. The coercive powers of the collective order. That would include supporters of industrial unions, for example, and government intervention in the economy. Buchanan, by contrast, pledged to train social philosophers, men, for the university at that point only admitted men, ready to put into effect a society based on liberty. With a hint of defensiveness, knowing that such, such exclusiveness was indeed unusual in an academic enterprise, he assured, quote, to start in a small way to produce such a line of new thinkers is an eminently legitimate endeavor for a great university. The center's members, Buchanan vowed, would take up such matters of uh, concern to Virginia's governing elite as the growing power of labor unions. The correct relationship between the federal government and the states, made all the more urgent by the recent uh, Supreme Court decision uh, in Brown, what he depicted as problems of equalitarianism, among them income redistribution, the welfare state, the tax, and the tax structure, which was his archaic way of speaking of egalitarianism, itself an indicator of how the program would approach these, these questions. And lastly, the social security system and its threat to individual initiative. More specifically, the center aimed to combat what its founders referred to as social engineering, the language of critics of the Supreme Court's Brown decision, uh, by changing the way people thought. They hoped to break up what he called the powerful grip that collective ideology had on the minds of intellectuals. Nearly everyone, even as they deferred on the particulars then, believed that in the age of the giant corporation, America needed what the liberal economist John Kenneth Galbraith had recently termed countervailing power, meaning organized workers and organized consumers. The federal government also, most people believed, must put its weight on the other side of the scale to ensure fair play and economic stability. Put simply, most Americans then trusted their government. In such an era, Buchanan said, and I quote, our purpose was indeed subversive, end quote. Uh, so fast forward to our current moment. American politics are in crisis in Washington and in the states. A government that is supposed to be of, by, and for the people is in crisis. Even elementary norms of decency and truth are in crisis in our political life today. You know this. It's become abundantly clear of late here in particular. Uh, to any who may not have been paying close attention before. But what you might be struggling to figure out is how we got here and what that means. The watershed that we have reached in our public life in America has been fed by many streams, some of which have received extensive attention from scholars. These streams include the movement conservatism that made Barry Goldwater the Republican candidate for president in 1964, just after he voted against the Civil Rights Act, Another and related stream is the religious right. And there is the white supremacist right, too. All of these are important and have produced the votes to affect radical policy change. But I'm here today to talk about another piece of the puzzle of how we got into the dangerous situation in which we now find ourselves. A missing piece, I believe, in the prevailing public dialogue. And that is the ideas that are guiding the billionaire-funded libertarian right made notorious by Charles Koch. And I believe it is a crucial piece that we've missed because it explains so much that otherwise seems mysterious. It's also crucial because knowing about this piece may equip 
citizens like all of us in this room to lead the way out of this mess before it is too late. As a public health uh, nurse recently wrote me about the book, and she, she uh, said by analogy, you need to get the diagnosis right if you're gonna figure out the correct treatment plan. And I thought that was a really, really nice way of uh, thinking about our challenge. And I will say that I believe that there is an unmarked peril in our situation right now. Lots of talk about lots of dangers on many fronts, but one that we're not talking about is that the noisiest threats are getting the most attention. Among them, the now chronic race baiting uh, and bullying coming from the White House. But as that spectacle draws nearly all media and voter attention, an even more menacing plan is moving along. In the 30 states that are now wholly dominated by this cause, which has radicalized uh, the Republican Party significantly. There's now an electoral stranglehold in the words of the Democracy Alliance in 30 states, uh, thanks to gerrymandering, uh, which is in the courts today. Also, this plan is moving along in federal agencies and state agencies and in the courts. And this plan is being pursued by a much smaller cause, but one that is archly determined and also breathtakingly well-funded. And this causes architects aim to permanently rewrite the rules of our society. And this cause has shown that they are willing to use these other more popular sections of the right, particularly the religious right and the white supremacist right, to get what they want. I'll state my case simply. Behind all the seeming chaos and dysfunction in our public life right now, there is a strategy in play, a cold-eyed, calculated strategy. And that strategy is far along. One of its field generals said to donors in late 2015, and I quote, we're close to winning. They, meaning the critics or the rest of us, they don't have the real path. They don't have the real path. That was Mark Holden, the head of Coke Industries government and public affairs operation, gloating to an invitation-only audience of billionaire and multimillionaire donors. Now, you've heard a lot in uh, recent years about the fortune that Charles Koch uh, has been investing in our politics. But what you've likely not heard about is the ideas, the technology, as Koch refers to them, that have made those investments suddenly so effective after three decades by his own uh, depiction of funding intellectuals, libertarian intellectuals on the right, seeking the technology that would let him break through. After three decades, now suddenly that money is effective. And through my research, I learned that it was an academic economist who taught Charles Koch that for capitalism of the variety that they believe in to thrive, democracy must be enchained. So the book that I'm here to talk to you about, Democracy in Chains, provides a backstory, an unknown backstory, to the defining moment in which we find ourselves, as it also uncovers that real path to which uh, Mark Holden referred. In its essence, the book is a story of two men, a thinker and a CEO, whose lives converged through a shared commitment to transform the model of government that our country built up through citizen organizing and pressure over the course of the 20th century. The thinker was a Tennessee-born economist named James McGill Buchanan, who spent most of his career in Virginia institutions, starting, uh, as I uh, indicated, in Charlottesville in, in 1956. And the CEO is, of course, the Kansas-based Charles Koch, who spent most of his adult life, when he wasn't building up Koch Industries into one of the biggest privately held corporations in the world, spent most of his adult life seeking a way to make our country and the world, in fact, confirm to his arch vision of economic liberty a kind of free reign capitalism akin to that 19th century variant that was skewered so brilliantly by the novelist Charles Dickens. The story my, uh, my book tells is first of all of the crucible in which Buchanan came up with this idea of enchaining democracy to insulate economic liberty as the civil rights movement was making headway in Virginia and the nation in the late 1950s and the 1960s. And then the story turns to how Charles Koch began funding an apparatus to make that idea a reality 
in a messianic quest that has produced the volatile situation we are now confronting. I have to admit up front, it is a frightening story. And I've actually heard now from five readers who have said it reads like a Stephen King uh, novel. Now, I've not read a Stephen King novel. I don't know, what, but I get the point that it is frightening. Um, uh, but I also believe that knowing what we're up against is vital to figuring out how to defend a democracy that I think many of us now understand is facing truly existential threat. Knowledge can be empowering, and that is what I'm hearing from readers who say things like, it feels like the curtain has been pulled back, and now we can see what is really going on. So that's encouraging to me, and I hope it will be, uh, feel that way uh, uh, to you as, as you mull this. But rather than lecture in a conventional way, I thought it would be maybe more interesting to share with you the story of how I stumbled, and I really did stumble on the trail that led me to these conclusions. Because I think that knowing the route that led me to make the claims I've just shared with you will give you an even sharper sense of the stakes. Because it turns out that what we are seeing now, today, is not the first time that the libertarian right has shown itself willing to exploit white supremacy to advance the cause of property supremacy. And the trail that led me to these conclusions also uh, I think is important in the context of a university setting because it reveals the surprising role that some scholars have played in bringing us to this point. And that, I think, is a history that all of us in academic settings need to wrestle with. So without uh, further ado, what led me to the conclusions I just shared? In a word, serendipity. <laughs> um, by accident, uh, I found this. I had just completed another book in 2006, and I was in Philadelphia, and I happened to go into the American Friends Service Committee archives, uh, where I came upon documentation of a story that I was embarrassed as someone who studies social movements and has always had a particular interest in the South. I was embarrassed that I didn't, I'd never heard of this story, and I was shocked by the story. And the story was that of the Prince Edward County, Virginia school closures from 1959 to 1964, uh, in which white county officials in Prince Edward answered the Supreme Court's call to desegregate its public schools without further delay by, as they put it, going out of the public school business entirely. They shuttered their entire public school system. They actually posted no trespassing signs on many schools. And they left black children with no formal education whatsoever, except what social movement organizations could provide, as their white counterparts headed off to private segregation academies with state-funded tax-subsidized tuition grants, what we would today call vouchers. And the county officials in Prince Edward persisted in this course for five years until the courts forced them to reinstate a public school system. So I was shocked by this story and deeply moved by what I found uh, in these archives. And I started to, to uh, research this, this story. And I fairly quickly uh, learned that tax-funded school vouchers were crucial to the story. But I also learned in fairly short order that the Chicago free market economist Milton Friedman, uh, famous for his book, Capitalism and Freedom, had issued his first manifesto for vouchers for private schools in 1955 in the full knowledge of how they would be used in the South, where segregationist officials uh, from the time uh, um, some of the first cases that, that became Brown went to the courts in, in 1951, from that time forward, the most arch segregationist officials in the South were saying, we will shut down public schools entirely before we let black and white children sit together uh, in our schools. So he knew this, um, and he produced this manifesto. And I know that he knew it, because I saw the correspondence with an editor who challenged him. Uh, anyway, Friedman thus became part of my story. But in following a footnote, actually in my friend Jim Hirschman's wonderful article on the moderate resistance uh, to um, uh, in the school's crisis in, in those years, from a, a footnote in Jim's work, I learned of a 1959 uh, report. As this Prince Edward County threat was in the air, uh, and after schools in three Virginia cities had been shut down by the governor, locking 13,000 white children, out of school for the whole fall of 1958, including in Charlottesville, I learned of a 1959 report by two other economists who had set up a center 
here at UVA in Charlottesville, one of them, James Buchanan. And their report attempted to refute the case that moderate whites were making in trying to save the public school system. And the moderate whites were saying, we already have a beggared school system. Um, we cannot afford to. It will destroy the public education system. So they were talking about saving the schools. And Buchanan and his colleague, Warren Nutter, tried to refute that case. Um, they made a case that if the state of Virginia sold off its facilities to private operators, it could provide better education without obeying the courts. So their report, in effect, called for privatizing Virginia schools before we even had that as a verb in our collective vocabulary, privatizing. Um, and they did this in the full knowledge that the schools thus funded by these tax-funded uh, tuition grants at a time when African Americans were not able to vote uh, nearly at all on, on these, these measures, uh, they did this in the full knowledge that the schools thus funded would be white segregation academies because those were the only private schools in question. Now, needless to say, it stunned me to see two university professors making a case for what their state's most arch segregationists were seeking. And it intrigued me that they did so not in racist terms, but in economic terms, leveraging the authority of their discipline to back up what the most right-wing, anti-democratic figures of the day were seeking in Virginia. They knew that they were exploiting the school's crisis to move their libertarian economic agenda. When they referred to as the free society, even as they showed no sympathy whatsoever for the black civil rights activists whose slogan was freedom now. In fact, the state also had five laws against the NAACP that deprived the NAACP of its free speech rights under the First Amendment in this period, but they had nothing to say about that. Their cover letter to these state officials, including uh, one who had proposed the anti-NAACP laws, their cover letter said they were using, uh, you know, they're, they're, they were making the case in the language of their discipline, quote, letting the chips fall where they may. Letting the chips fall where they may. And when I read that, that phrase just lodged itself like a shard in my gut. And I just thought, who are these people? You know, it really was a mystery. Historians pursue puzzles, and that was a mystery to me, and that's what got me uh, on to this research project. Um, and I wondered, how could anybody do such a thing? Not in mindless ignorance or inherited bigotry, but actually in cold-eyed calculation. So I began to seek more information about this James Buchanan. And I learned that he won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1986. He was awarded it for having uh, pioneered a new way of thinking called public choice economics, which became influential not only in economics, but also in political science uh, and in uh, legal studies, and also among activists and elected officials on the right. And what Buchanan did that was new was what he liked to call the economic analysis of politics. But it was a very particular economic analysis. It was the kind of economic analysis that he had learned at the University of Chicago that argued that we cannot see people as members of groups. That is just not meaningful. We must think about them as individuals with each individual rationally pursuing their own individual self-interest in whatever they do in politics as the Chicago thinkers uh, uh, imagined in, uh, as they did in the market. And Buchanan's big concern was, was to undermine the idea that actors in public life were actually working for the common good, and I'll come back to that. Now, this new way of thinking led Buchanan to some innovations that got wide attention. For example, he came up with a new explanation of why governments run deficits uh, that has proven persuasive to many. He solved a puzzle that the prevailing Keynesian economists of his day, following uh, John Maynard Keynes, could not explain, had not explained. And that was why government would run deficits, not just in times of depression or recession, when the government was needed to you know, inject money into the economy to hold up demand, but why those uh, uh, um, um, deficits would also continue during times of prosperity. And Buchanan's explanation was that it was officials' self-interest in re-election uh, that led them to make multiple promises to multiple constituencies that they couldn't really pay for in the knowledge that the costs would be borne by others. Um, 
and his own training was in public finance, so he was very in interested in these questions of taxation, revenue, uh, government spending, and so forth. Uh, and so that interest in containing government uh, spending also led him to new emphasis on the incentives of the political process and how tweaking uh, incentives and the rules of the process could yield different outcomes. Stay with me here, I know some of this gets abstract. But, uh, so some of these ideas have since interested people who are not on the right, including Cass Sunstein, who worked for President Obama in regulation. He wrote a book, authored a book called Nudge, that was kind of interesting, and they pointed to things like, if you, and this again is playing with incentives in a, in a modest way, but say you took children's breakfast cereal, right? And instead of putting it right at the cart, at the eye level, where kids are gonna grab the sugary cereal and put it in the cart, if you put the sh healthy stuff at kids' eye level and put the sugary stuff down down below or up above, you might just get a good public health result without actually interfering with anybody's uh, freedom. So, so you can use these ideas in different ways, and other people have. But Buchanan's version, what came to be called the Virginia School of Public Choice, was always distinctive. Buchanan said, looking back uh, in a documentary, he said that when he set to work, the idea of the public interest was dominant. And he said, that he said, my goal was to tear that down, to tear down the idea of the public interest. And there again, silly me, I thought, why would anybody want to do that? You know, I'm a historian, right? I know there's no such thing as the public interest like this, you know, monitor here. It's not a thing. It's something that we construct together through dialogue and debate. You know, we've been doing it ever since democracies existed, but you persuade enough people. If you do, you change policies and good things happen that people believe in. Not Buchanan, he did not like that idea of the public interest. So again, it was a puzzle for me. Why would anybody want to tear down that idea? And what I learned is that to a libertarian like Buchanan, there is no common good. Any such notion of shared purpose will lead government to coerce those who don't agree with the majority. Democracy, Buchanan and his colleagues came to argue, violates the individual liberty of the minority. In the case of wealthy taxpayers who don't share the majority's view of the public interest, such men argued, it all but steals their property if it taxes them for purposes they don't share. And even in his scholarly work, Buchanan was quite agitational. In his 1975 masterwork, he actually said, what difference is there between a thug in Central Park who steals my wallet and a government that taxes me for purposes I don't share? So quite agitational. Uh, and basically, he was at pains to insist that we are not our brother's keepers, uh, or at least that we shouldn't use government uh, to shift tax revenues from one citizen to another. And he came to talk about all this in very stark and foreboding terms. In fact, in a language that I think we can all recognize now as dehumanizing. He called net tax recipients, the people who get more from government than they pay in in taxes, uh, people that Mitt Romney would later refer to, to most people's shock, as the 47%. This language goes back to this school of thought. Buchanan referred to such people as, quote, parasites on the productive, parasites. And he warned of what he called predators and prey. Uh, employing a vocabulary that made fellow citizens seem like menaces from the animal world. To him, uh, the predators were citizens who were going to government. Say, you could say the sanitation workers that Reverend King lost his life supporting in a strike, who wanted better wages, who wanted decent conditions. Those would be paid for by tax revenues because they were public sector workers, right? Or environmentalists who wanted the government to uh, clean up air and water or that some people didn't care about as a public purpose. These were the predators. The prey were the wealthy taxpayers who didn't support these uh, 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 public projects. And this vocabulary, if you think about it for a minute, is a disinhibiting vocabulary, right? In referring to people in animal language rather than human language, it's a disinhibiting vocabulary and one that licenses hostility. And it is a language I think we all can see that is rife on the American right today, owing to decades of inculcation uh, below the radar. Now, as I read more, I learned too that for those who think this way, 
Justice is a simple matter. And this is a quote from Buchanan's colleague, Walter Williams, uh, you may have heard of. I keep what I earn, you keep what you earn. Uh, and the idea behind this is that you collectively can only legitimately tax me if I agree with all your goals and methods. So in the libertarian view, only if there is unanimity can a purpose truly be said to be fair or advancing the common good. Now, Buchanan didn't stop there. Believing this way, in the 1970s, he moved from scholarship to active organizing, to trying to conjure what he referred to as a counterintelligentsia. And he argued to donors on the right that they needed to create what he called a gravy train to cultivate such a counterintelligentsia, to fund the scholarships, to fund the faculty positions, to fund the prizes that would uh, create this hardcore libertarian presence uh, in the academy and in public life. And as he organized, he also moved from analysis to prescription, to what he called constitutional economics. And his goal was de to design a legal regime that could protect capitalism from government, that could enshrine the rights of the wealthy minority to a degree no society anywhere had done. And he said on more than one occasion that by that measure, the protection of the rights of that economic minority Every constitution in the world was a failure, that none of them did this adequately. Now, he found a very interested audience uh, for these ideas among some generals in need of a new constitution. In 1980, the military junta of General Augusto Pinochet in Chile uh, and its uh, allies in the civilian corporate sector invited Buchanan to Santiago to share his ideas for how to devise such a constitution that would protect capitalism from government. And basically, the dictatorship was seeking a way, since they had an export-driven economy, they needed to have you know, better relations with the world, but they were a par pariah through the 1970s and into the 1980s because of the gro grotesque human rights violations that they had engaged in in taking and maintaining power. Um, and while there was no right for workers to organize in unions or for farmers to organize or for students to organize or for faculty to have free speech rights on campuses, while all that was, uh, was going on, uh, they were looking to create this new constitution and Buchanan came down in 1980 to uh, advise on that in, in some detail. And the result of his advice is still in effect today in Chile. In 2013, Michelle Bachelet, a president who was elected by about two-thirds of the Chilean people on a wide-ranging reform program driven especially by students because Chile's cost of college education had grown so high that it was among the highest in the world. It was incredibly burdensome to children and their parents. There was great pressure to change these things they'd inherited from the dictatorship. And Michelle Bachelet got into office and she said, she realized that what she called the authoritarian trammels of this constitution were keeping her from delivering to that super majority of the Chilean people on what they wanted. She said that the constitution of liberty, as they called it when they wrote it in 1980, the constitution of liberty, in her words, put locks and bolts on what government could do. Now here I think it's important to say locks and bolts are not the same thing as checks and balances, right? I think everybody in this room understands that a constitution, a democratic constitution where you have a situation of you know, a predominantly majority rule, of course it needs checks and balances, right? It needs to re respect the constitutional rights of minorities. We would not have had the Brown decision without that. We would not have uh, equal marriage without uh, checks and balances, but this is something else. This is locks and bolts. And friends, that kind of constitution is now coming to America, thanks to pressure from the Koch Donor Network. Led by Charles Koch and the donors he's accept, he has uh, convened, the hundreds of donors he's convened, the radical rich in our country, through the organizations they fund, are seeking to achieve the kind of binding change that Buchanan urged without informing the public of their true goals. And thanks to assiduous organizing by the apparatus these arch donors fund, groups like ALEC, you may have heard of, the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Heritage Foundation, lots and lots of others. Um, uh, thanks to organizing by them uh, and a Republican party that they have all but taken over with the threat of primary challenges, another 
tactic inspired by Buchanan's uh, kind of thinking. Um, this cause now has in place 27 of the 34 states needed to call a constitutional convention in our country. It actually was 28, but Common Cause organized hard in New Mexico and got one back. Uh, but 27 of the 34 states needed for a constitutional convention. Now, I don't know how recent your, your early American history is, but we have, last time we had a constitutional convention was 1787, when the Constitution was created. This is an incredibly radical undertaking, and it's a very dangerous undertaking, because there are rules for how you get delegates to such a convention. There are no rules on what they can do. In fact, I was just in Illinois where the provost had been a law school dean and pointed out in the discussion that they could actually repeal the Bill of Rights if they wanted to um, once they get the delegates there. Now, I don't think that's what they'll do, but the Koch people are coming in with at least 10 what they call liberty amendments that would radically alter our government and our society and our way of life. Um, so uh, we're looking at really serious stuff, a bid at incredibly radical change. Now, you might be wondering how I put together the way that Buchanan's ideas were guiding this real plan, or real path rather, as Mark Holden put it, of the radical right. And the answer is again, by coincidence. I happened to move to North Carolina in 2010, just as a radicalized Republican Party, funded by the Kochs and their partner in North Carolina, a man named Art Pope, uh, pushed by the Tea Party that these guys had also helped supported, won majorities in both houses of the state legislature. And suddenly, the things that I was reading about in Buchanan's published work that still seemed so abstract became concrete and shocking as North Carolina, the North Carolina General Assembly's lead donor, Art Pope, his organization Civitas, boasted of the big bang his grantees were delivering as they made this once moderate state, again boasting, a laboratory for radical change of the kind they sought. So what did I see happening in this big bang in North Carolina. And I have to tell you that for people who lived through it, you probably had your own version, many other states did, it was like the shock and awe doctrine of warfare being applied, right? Where you push on so many fronts at once that you are basically intimidating the people you're fighting and you are trying to paralyze their will to resist with your superior display of power. People were shocked. Longtime residents in North Carolina could not believe the kinds of things that their state was doing. So, Buchanan Connection. Buchanan had long urged his teammates, uh, who didn't like the outcomes of public policy, to stop focusing on the question of who rules and focus on the rules. And he explained to like thinkers and to those who funded them, including Charles Koch and other donors on the right, that if you wanted to get the kind of radical transformation that the libertarians did and that most Americans did not want, you must focus laser-like on systematically changing the rules of governance. And what I watched unfold in North Carolina was a stunning barrage of such radical rules changes on this model, one after another. Extreme gerrymandering to misrepresent the will of the electorate, to make voters' votes meaningless. New measures to undermine workers' ability to organize together in unions, particularly public sector unions, which were always uh, an object of ire from Buchanan. He didn't even think public employees should have a right to vote. Um, attacks on public education at all levels and radical cuts in funding for it. Repeal of a hard-won racial justice act to stop discrimination in policing and in the court system. Refusal to accept the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act despite a crying need for health care among North Carolinians who made too much to qualify for Medicaid and not enough to be able to afford health insurance on their own. Rolling back measures to protect the environment and reduce global warming. Ending in all of these things, normal procedures of government, things like hearings, transparency, all of this stuff rushed through, some stuff after, after midnight. And then to cap it off, what has come to be known as the Monster Voter Suppression Bill, that it had something like 15 different titles designed to keep people who would vote against this agenda away from uh, the polls. 
And what proved so disturbing to me, both as a scholar and as a citizen, was that I could see that this new Republican majority was applying Buchanan's ideas, the ideas of his school of thought to get what they otherwise could not, not if they argued for it openly to the electorate. Also, though, unsettling to me was watching how critics of all of this, including good, well-intentioned people who were shocked at the U-turn their beloved state was taking, how they were missing the deep operational strategy that unified all of these varied measures. They couldn't see that the men pursuing this agenda were not misinformed about the likely consequences of the agenda they were pushing. They fully understood that these measures would inflict grievous harm on many of their fellow citizens, right? Whether it was the people who would die because they would not have access to health care through the Medicaid expansion, the children whose learning was stifled by these radical cuts to the public schools and siphoning off monies to private schools that one shock judge said had no legal obligation to teach students anything. They knew what they were doing. But they believed that the end game was worth the price. They were, you could say, in cold calculation, letting the chips fall where they may. And what my fellow critics of all of this did not see, not even the brilliant Reverend William Barber, who created an inspiring movement called Moral Mondays to fight all this, what the critics did not see was that this agenda was backed by an ethical system that gave these actors confidence and let them feel heroic enough to weather the criticism and the opposition. This is an ethical system foreign to most of us. In fact, it is antithetical to all the world's major religious traditions, if you think about it. Uh, but it has its own stark coherence that we need to understand if we are going to deal effectively with the crisis that Buchanan's ideas and Koch's money have wrought. So, to put it concretely, the libertarian morality says that it would be better to have people die from lack of health care than to receive it from government, from taxes paid for by others. This really is ultimately, at the end of the day, what they mean by personal responsibility. You should be on your own. You should be saving, in their dream world, each one of us should be saving from the time we're sentient for our schooling, which we will pay for in their dream world, it won't be provided, for our unemployment, if we happen to be unemployed, for our health care, for our retirement security, for any needs we have, because we shouldn't be getting those needs supplied by government. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I've had six women in my life, including my stepmother, who have had breast cancer. And I have to tell you, I don't know how anyone saves for catastrophic illness in America. It is impossible. But yet, this cause somehow believes that you are somehow morally less, less, less uh, worthy if you're not able to take care of your, your own needs. Now, I learned all of this and more in 2013 when James Buchanan died, and that September I got access to his private archive at George Mason University. And ironically, I went, the weekend I went, the government was being shut down uh, by radical Republicans in Congress, led by Ted Cruz, who were familiar with Buchanan's ideas, uh, and they were actually in this shutdown, as in so much else they're doing, applying the kind of coercive bargaining that he taught the right and corporate allies. And in Buchanan's records, I found my developing understanding of the import of all of this confirmed in a way that sometimes literally took my breath away. I'll give you just one example. In his private office, I found stacked helter-skelter on a chair, a pile of documents that exposed how Charles Koch and George Mason University economics faculty, along with George Mason higher administration, cooperated to establish a base camp, an academic base camp for this project right across the Potomac from Washington, DC. An academic base camp for a clearly political project. I actually found out about it because the papers came from a whistleblower who said this is illegal what they're doing. Once I brought home the hundreds of documents I'd copied there, 
uh, and put them together with Buchanan's writing and other sources, I found myself laying down pieces of a puzzle that I have to tell you sometimes nauseated me in its scope and its audacity. Because it now encompasses dozens of ostensibly separate national organizations, some of whose names will be familiar to you, like the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the American Legislative Exchange Council, even the Federalist Society Charles Koch put seed money uh, into. Uh, and if you include the state level operations that make up the so-called state policy network uh, that are forced to cooperate as a condition of funding, um, you have, by the way, in Virginia, I printed it out, you have uh, two affiliates and eight, was it eight? No, 10, 10 associate members of um, this state policy network here. Um, if you put those together with the international affiliates of something called the Atlas Network that has operations in 90 countries, we are talking about hundreds of organizations working to radically alter government and society to bring this kind of free reign capitalism into being without being honest with the people about what they're doing. They issue bromides like free, what do they call it, pro-growth policies, limited government, et cetera. They don't tell you what they're actually doing, what they're actually seeking. They use people. And as I took the measure of this project, I saw something else. The form of government that these men see as ideal, as liberty, mirrors that of mid-century Virginia in all but the state-mandated segregation. When James McGill Buchanan set to work in Charlottesville in 1956 at the peak of massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education, that state, this state, had just been identified by the political scientist V.O. Key as the most oligarchical state in the South and therefore in America. And V.O. Key wrote that next to Virginia, Mississippi is a hotbed of democracy. <laughs> that's, that's, what a, that's what an oligarchy uh, dominated state it was. And so here we come full circle to the civil rights era history with which I started. For what is the substance of James Buchanan's and Charles Koch's vision of liberty but mid-century Virginia, the, century sub the state subjected to the most thorough control by an oligarchy, in V.O. Key's words, but with tools that are now to be grafted on to the nation as a whole. The state-mandated racial oppression would go, will go, uh, the cause would never advocate for that, but nearly everything else about the political economy of mid-century Virginia enacts their dream. Let me just quickly review these before closing. The uncontested sway of the wealthiest citizens the use of right to work laws and other ploys to keep working people powerless. The ability to fire dissenting public employees at will, targeting educators in particular. Voting rights restrictions to keep those unlikely to agree with the elite from the polls. The deployment of states' rights arguments to defer, deter the federal government from promoting equal treatment. The suspicion of public education as a source of subversion. The regressive tax system and refusal to make forward-looking public investments. The opposition to Social Security and Medicare. And the parsimonious response to public needs of all kinds, from decent schools to public health and clean air and water. And the question this stealth plan presents Americans with, once we know it, is at one level quite simple. Do we want to live in a cosmetically updated version of mid-century Virginia? A place that crushed democracy and human dignity to allow its elites free reign? A state determined to prevent the kind of government that citizen action had demanded at least since the populist movement of the 1890s. A government that could stand up to uh, corporations that run roughshod over the people, that can protect workers' rights and public health, that can provide economic security to the aged, that can take action against discrimination, that can ensure our air and water quality uh, and the fate of our planet. All this and more is at risk from the cause that I have been talking about here. And we need to think about, as we think about what is happening in our public life today, is what this cause seeks the kind of country that we want to live in or bequeath to our children and their children. That is the real public choice. Thank you.
Well, we know that Ed Gillespie is running for governor. Yes. Would you say a little bit about Ed Gillespie's role in gerrymandering? Uh, uh, I think others here might be, might be uh, maybe Jim, should I call on you? I know he was very involved in the, the Red Map project. Yeah, there's actually a book whose name I cannot say on your videotape that is really brilliant by a guy named uh, David Daly, who is the political, politi political editor of Salon when he wrote it. And the title of the book is, um, uh, well, I tried to get it by his name when I called my local bookstore. And then she said, but what's the title? And I said, well, it's rat fucked. <laughs> <laughs> there are two asterisks. It's a brilliant book about why gerrymandering is so awful, so absolutely toxic uh, to democracy. Uh, but he was told by his editors that they would not use the word gerrymandering in the title because it, it's such a bad word for conveying the way these radical gerrymanders essentially make your vote worthless and let the people who are in office elect their voters rather than the other way around. So my own, my own district uh, in North Carolina is described in Daly's book uh, and in legal filings as a snowball hitting a windshield and melting. It is carved up and sliced and diced so dramatically in order to ensure that nobody challenges our state legislature. And he was part of this red map uh, project that the journalist Jane Mayer has written brilliantly about and there is uh, before the courts actually today as we, as we meet. Yeah, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. Thank you so much for your work and for your book. Uh, just, uh, I, I learned a lot. I, I'm kind of curious if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship between white supremacy and uh, um, property freedom. Uh -huh. Because you mentioned a couple things, and, and I, I was struggling with this in my book a little bit. You mentioned kind of using white supremacy as a way of kind of stealthily pursuing uh, property freedom and the kind of the race baiting is getting a lot of the press and this stuff. Is, but it seems like um, white supremacy and property freedom have been tied together very tightly um, yes, throughout the history of our country, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering how, at, in this current moment, is it more useful to think of them as together mm -hmm. and ask not to separate them? Or is it more useful to separate them and think of them as, uh, you know, one being used to hide Right. The stealth work of the other. Right. Yeah, well, well, I mean, and one of the things I, I think I say in the book, sometimes you don't remember what happened with all the cuts. The original work was twice as long as the final one. But these, th these causes were, you know, twined at the roots from the very beginning of our country, right? In a, in a society that was founded on racial slavery. In 1860, there were more millionaires in Mississippi than in New York City. That was because slavery was the most profitable form of capitalism. Uh, so it's really hard to separate uh, those things out. And one of the figures who did a lot to fuse them was John C. Calhoun, the South Carolina senator who was fame, uh, is remembered today for declaring on the floor of the Senate that slavery is a positive good. But Calhoun was also styled himself a precocious libertarian. And he wrote two volumes on government, basically interpreting the US Constitution in his way. And what he was afraid of was that the North was growing, right? The North had a different kind of economy, was getting all kind, you know, um, people coming from abroad, new citizens, and was turning against slavery. And that was a threat to this economic institution and social institution to which he was committed. And so he developed an, probably the most creative and original anti-democratic theory that we have in America, at least until uh, recent years. Um, and, um, and, he did that, and he also, Madison was appalled by his ideas, I think it's worth saying, uh, said they'd be the end of free government everywhere. But, uh, but in any way, he, he developed these ideas. Now, interestingly, Calhoun's ideas were being in, revived in Virginia in order to fight the Brown versus Board of Education system by the journalist James Jackson Kilpatrick, who used Ca uh, Calhoun's theory of interposition to say states could fight the federal government. What's interesting about that is that Calhoun's ideas were part of Virginia public conversation as James Buchanan comes to Virginia and starts thinking about the Constitution. And what's interesting is that two of Buchanan's own colleagues at George Mason have said that Buchanan's system of political economy has the same, the quote from them, the same purpose and effect as Calhoun's. So 
Uh, that's not me, that's his colleagues. Uh, so, and I, and I think that's true. I think it is so radically anti-democratic that it harks back to that and probably took inspiration from, from Calhoun's theories. So, um, so I guess the way I would think about this now is that, um, it, uh, you know, I, I did not want to go beyond my evidence. I had readers who were reading my book and saying, this is racist. <laughs> this is all oh, these guys. So bad. And I'm like, I'm sticking to my evidence, to what I'm finding in the sources. And I also didn't want to let white people off the hook, frankly, because I think when you say something is racist, there, a, a door closes in the mind of a lot of white people and they think it's a sin of the heart, you know, or a bad attitude. And what I was trying to say with the book and the way I wrote about it is exactly what you were saying, that we need to think about these things together, that this system of political economy be absolutely devastating for African Americans and other people who were exclu historically excluded from full citizenship, but frankly, it would be awful for us all. These, this vision, I believe, is an utterly unsustainable society in social terms, in environmental terms, and in another term. So that was too, too long-winded a response, but it was okay. I, just two cents uh, follow-up. I, yeah. I, I, think, I think part of the really exciting thing about your argument is it's associating the, the, the protection of economic elites yeah. with the protection of white supremacy, mm -hmm. which runs directly counter to all this discussion about uh, locating uh, white supremacy among the white working class. Exactly, yeah. absolutely. Yes. And, and so I think that's another kind of stealth move. That's yes, to. and it's highly strategic. Highly right? strategic, and I yeah. think you're helping to point that out. So yes, and also I think this is worth knowing. Charles Koch funds things like something called the Institute for Humane Studies that tries to recruit young academics and train them into these ideas and does all these things that sound really nice, but he also funds things like something called Judicial Watch that sent out mailings, and I know because I got on their mailing list to know what these people are up to. In the run-up to the 2016 election, almost every week we were barraged with mailings saying, do you realize your election is about to be stolen by millions of illegal aliens? Now, anybody, anybody who's honest knows the last thing undocumented people would do is try to vote. You know, they don't want to call attention to themselves, but that was deliberate race baiting to get people to the polls to vote for this radicalized Republican Party that's carrying the donor's agenda. So it is really calculated. Yes, sir. Yeah, just to follow up on Carl's point, um, one of the I don't want to give you a question where it's like, so what do we do from here? But in a way, that's kind of where I'm naturally led. And, and that's even from my own research about kind of what's been going on here in Charlottesville recently. And, you know, we talk about all oh, this kind of libertarian ethos. It's almost become an aesthetic in this country. And you find it at the religious level. You find it at the economic level. You find it at the racial level. And in, in some ways, it almost seems random. You know, do you hear the, the neo-Nazis coming into town and they're telling us that when you're chanting Black Lives Matter, it's like that's what Google would want you to do, which would seem almost kind of, if we're thinking about it in this libertarian way, like they're kind of making an anti-corporate statement through their white supremacy. So anyways, the question, the long way of getting to this is, so how do we address something where it seems that almost it's just kind of embedded itself in American society, even beyond the economic level that it's kind of now just a way of, like if you see Trump say something, you just instinctually defend it, no matter what the message is, just because you have an identity as a Republican or as right. a Trump supporter. And I will say, I think that these guys are counting on that too, on activating that kind of tribal identity to keep us yelling at one another and not focusing on them. So one thing that I've suggested with a lot of audiences and people seem to like the idea of is um, uh, taking a time out from Trump. <laughs> okay, because he is a classic con man, right? He is like, you know, every five minutes, it seems like, he's out there saying, doing something outrageous, and everybody is transfixed, and everybody's focusing on him, while meanwhile, he's got an administration that is docked with veterans of the Koch network. By one experienced researcher's count, 70% of his senior appointees come out of these Koch enterprises, and radical changes on this model are being pushed through in agency after agency and in the courts, and we're not paying attention. So if, just try it for a week. First of all, your mental health will improve, your digestion, everything will be better. If you ignore Trump, pay no attention to the tweets, any article with him in it, forget about it, don't look at it. Instead, think about what's going on in your state, because they also count on the fact that 
uh, fewer than 20% of people pay attention to state affairs, so you can do radical changes at the state level without being noticed. Pay attention to what's going on in your states, pay attention to what's going on in the Department of Justice, the Environmental Protection Agency. You know, you could go on and on and on with pl places where these changes are being pushed through. So do that, talk to people about it, write about it, and I think that would begin to change things. Uh, Randy. Um, you mentioned uh, that there were 10 amendments that uh, the folks have Putting together. Could you give us an idea of what they might include? There's actually a book by uh, someone who has also gotten Coke funding, a, a man named Mark Levin, uh, a legal person and also talk show, right wing talk show host. And he actually has a book. Um, is it called The Liberty Amendments or it contains The Liberty Amendments? But there are 10, uh, 10, 10 or 12. And they, are, they include things like um, uh, a balanced budget amendment, which you know, many people think, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, balanced budget amendment. But whenever anybody actually really talks about it, it always loses in politics because it would paralyze government. It would lead to the undermining of Social Security and Medicare and continuing expenses like that. They also get this, and they really want to roll back a century. That We really need to be like mindful of this, at least a century. So one of the things they want to do is get rid of the progressive era reform that had direct election of US senators. They want to go back to when state legislatures would pick the senators. Now, of course, this cause most easiest business most easily controls the state level, so of course they want to do that. But I mean, that in itself is pretty, pretty shocking, right, to go back to that. Um, they want uh, voter ID to be part of the Constitution. Uh, I, you know, I can't even count them all, but you could, you could find this book easily enough. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty stunning. Yes, you had your hand up? Oh, I thought you did. Okay. Yes, Matt. I don't want to be the person who asks you to write a, another book or work on the next project. I'm kind of curious. I have to think about a lot of, a lot of stuff here. Um, I'm wondering, like, in your research, what, what have you seen? Uh, have you seen any type of convergence between um, kind of what you identified as happening to this say on the right, the convergence between that and what's on the left? And I, I really why I bring this up because I mean, you know, there's a number. Of, uh, I just say left is sort of a thinker that political spectrum, you know, from someone like Sheldon Wollins, you know, political theories, like to say it's that from on um, American Incorporated, right, which tries to just articulate this idea of just manage democracy by the elite. And you know, if you also know, a little bit more to the left with someone like Chomsky and so forth, mm -hmm. you know, try to make this claim of, you know, property of people and so forth and so on. But we still end up with some of the similar results without the without the presence of the type of ideology, the culture of ideology that's attached to, to the right of the type of kind of libertarianism that's, that's taken on much more kind of cultural sort of valences more recently. I'm just wondering, have you seen any type of, you know, kind of convergences? Because cause essentially, on my view, I mean, some of the type of economic sort of like strategies by the left um, are not all that different from, you know, the right. The difference that I see, just to put it very crudely, you know, is that the right has become much more sort of like cultural, sort of like ideological in ways in which, much more explicit in ways in which the left tends to have not been as much. Can you and be concrete of what you're thinking of what you're thinking about? Yeah, so like, I mean, so, I don't know, think about someone like, you know, this, this, maybe someone like Boz or Lippin or somebody, right, who, who's, who's kind of venerated in a particular sort of way on the left. I mean, but, you know, Lippin was very critical of democracy in, the, in this sense. That even though he was a champion in, in a certain way, he was, he was against it so far as like, well, we want to be worried about kind of the tyranny of the majority, right? And so we have to kind of manage this through a certain kind of like, you know, um, elites to try to prevent sort of the mass and kind of, you know, over Yeah, so. Yeah, well, and I think it actually comes back to your question that I realized I neglected the, the question you were asking about kind of libertarianism being in the water supply, like fluoride, <laughs> fluoride or something now. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, there are, as long as we've had democracy, there have been critiques of democracy, right? And people writing about it or being frustrated with voters or, or things like that. So, and that should be part of our public discourse, right? That we challenge that, we try to educate people, we try to change the conversation. Um, so that's all fine. What I am uh, reacting to and objecting to is the fact that I could see in the sources that, the, and this is not all libertarians, but these are the people who are affiliated with the Kochs, who are on this kind of payroll, the operations, the apparatus and stuff, uh, or at least the higher up ones, 
They are doing what they're doing in the way that they're doing it because they understand that they are a permanent major minority, a very small minority, and that if they fly under honest sales, people will not support what they want, will not agree with them. And Charles Koch actually said when he gave his first $10 million to George Mason University, where they've built up this base camp, he said in, in a speech with that gift, he said, since we are greatly outnumbered, the this has seared itself into my brain. Since we are greatly outnumbered, the failure to uh, use our superior technology, again, he, remember he thinks he's at three, three MIT degrees from, uh, uh, in engineering, he thinks of ideas as technology. Since we are greatly outnumbered, the failure to use our superior technology ensures failure. So what he's getting at there is that if you want to win, which he does because he's messianic and he thinks he knows what's best for us, you will use that technology to get what you want around the backs of the majority who will not agree with you. And that is the thing that I find horrifying. I teach the history of social movements. Everybody has a right to make a case for their position. You know, that is just like, like that is basic, but you have to to succeed eventually, you have to persuade the majority and you have to be honest about what you're doing. And what so offends me about this cause is that they are not being honest. They are trying to smuggle this in by these radical rules changes. Now, to your question though about liberty being in the water supply, I mean, first of all, it's like America, right? I mean, like, and most of us believe in freedom. You know, the civil rights movement, freedom now was the slogan, the new left. There was all, you know, freedom is good. Most of us want freedom. Uh, so I don't think we want to be in the position of saying, we're the anti-freedom people, right? But, um, but I think what we need to understand is that their version of liberty would take away the freedom from the majority. Take away the freedom of workers to organize together in unions, take away, I mean, there's like so many freedoms of other people would be taken by their liberty. And there's a brilliant poem by Langston Hughes that gets at this, it's called Refugee in America. And the first stanza yeah. is about freedom and how sweet and wonderful it is and how he loves it. And the second one is about liberty. And he's like, if you know what I know, you know, he's like basically he's terrified of liberty. He said, if you knew what I knew, you'd know the reason why. So I think we need to do that work, you know, to talk to people of, you know, who support freedom and make clear that that economic liberty will take away the freedom of the majority, I think. Um, I guess. Could you map out for us a little bit the divisions uh, within the, among the libertarians, both associationally and ideologically? Uh, well, so, I mean, that libertarianism is a broader phenomenon. There is a libertarian party that Charles Koch gave up on long ago. Um, so, uh, uh, my focus in this book was on this Coke donor network. And I actually, you know, at this point, he, his money is so supreme that few people will take issue with it. So there have been fights in some of these organizations like the Cato Institute, which in the 1970s, he insisted must be so radical, must never compromise. So they supported legalized prostitution, sex between any consenting adults. They opposed US military actions, you know, on and on with a kind of libertarian uh, agenda, well, now they don't say that anymore. <laughs> and the people who push for that kind of got elbowed to the side because now it's about conquering power. And a similar thing happened at the Heritage uh, Foundation. So while I think that there were some significant differences before, I basically think at this point, any institution that is accepting money from the Charles Koch donor network will be pushed by that network to support that agenda because that's how he works. We can see it in the Republican Party. You know, privatize is a verb we didn't used to have. Well, to be primaried is a new verb. And that's why the Republican Party has been, it's captive. It is now, it is like a Leninist party in America, right? A Leninist libertarian party of the right because it has a discipline like a Leninist party in that as soon as they make a decision, everybody has to go with it or you get bounced out. And so what they've done is use these piles of donor cash to threaten anyone who doesn't to toe the line. And that's how they get compliance. Um, and uh, it's really, it's a really chilling thing, but it, it has worked very effectively. So I sort of forgot where I was. Yeah, <laughs> yes, did you have a hand? So I guess different regions and kind of countries as a whole have had experiments with extreme deregulation, uh -huh. especially in the 20th century, but we've had sort of the cultural resiliency or ethical systems or institutions that have kind of allowed us to, to reform and, and you know, get, get progressive uh, advances in for people. Do you see anything that concerns you about maybe the failure of those cultural norms or institutions going forward? Um. I think I need a little more concrete. <laughs> I guess I'm just saying, is, is there any consolation in history 
In fact, that we've kind of rebounded from, from some pretty extreme yeah. bouts of deregulation in the past. I see what you're saying. Uh, or, um, or is there something fundamentally different? Or, Right. Uh, well, I, you know, I am a, I'm a glass half full <laughs> kind of person. So, I mean, I actually, I think that this is a moment of incredible threat and danger. I also think that precisely because of that, it's also a moment of opportunity. So as a historian, I see this, this period that we're in as being like, because we've always had these warring forces, as you were suggesting before, deeply anti-democratic forces in our culture, and then forces who look to the Declaration of Independence um, and the promise of that, and we're more uh, democracy minded. So think about the 1860s and 1870s, the 1930s, those were sharp contests. It was not clear which way America was gonna go and which side was gonna win out. In both those periods, the more democratic forces won out, but to, do, to win, they had to really rejuvenate and renew democracy. I think we're in a moment like that now, and so the question is, is what happens. You had your hand up before. Um, I was just curious about the, the vision that the libertarians have for higher education. Do they um, in, imagine that since since everyone should pay their own way in life, um, the tuitions for, for universities and colleges will get higher and higher, and so only the elite will be able to afford to go to them? Uh -huh. And what do they think about community colleges and yeah. the, uh, technical yeah. training uh -huh. for working class people that don't go right. to college? What, what, how does that's a crucial question. I also, there's something else on yours that I didn't say, which is that this deregulation agenda is also, these are the people who are fighting so hard against our doing anything about climate change. Because the only people who can do anything about climate change are powerful bodies, which means governments, right? Private sector actors are never gonna do this. So there, that's why I think you can, that's where you can see that this is calcified into a really dangerous, destructive ideology because this COPE network is also funding climate science denial. And many of these people are actually engage on the, in attacks on the reputations of climate scientists. They're so determined to end um, any action on climate science. So that's an area of deregulation where we can see there will be no turning back and rebounding if we don't get this. On your question about education, I have a chapter uh, in the book called A World Gone Mad that's about Buchanan's reaction to the campus unrest of the 60s. And he came out with this book that applied his school of analysis to what was happening and basically came up with what is kind of the blueprint that's being followed by these Tea Party-led governments in state after state, including yours and mine and, and many others. But one of the things he pushed for was full-cost tuition, right? That there should not be scholarships. Um, and he thought too many, basically, they thought too many working-class people were getting educated, and that was a danger to social stability. Um, but, and also, if everybody had to pay the full cost of their tuition, they'd, they'd be... I don't know, proper libertarians and more responsible. There's a whole, and, and also efforts to change faculty governance, um, tenure, all of that um, came out of this, this early thing. At some point, I'm um, also, we have um, uh, Sam um, Parsons here, Samantha Parsons, who could tell us about the higher education experience where you have a lot of Coke money. She's from George Mason University and a great group of young people called Uncoke My Campus. Um, so maybe you can tell us how you experience the Cokes on your campus and then like what your... Oh, well, I was just going to directly respond to your question about also, and we need to remember that the Cokes are also funding politicians in states that are defunding higher education. Yes, yes. And then so like GMU has been the highest funded university, right? The Cokes now fund over 400 universities in the country. And so what we see is that you know they're getting they're winning at the state level, defunding higher ed. And then I like I have a visual of like Coke on a white horse who like rides in on his white horse, offers up funding to these universities. They are strapped for funding, so they need it and they take it, but there's often strings attached to it that are violating academic freedom, violating faculty governance, and what's allowing them to set up these centers that they're using for the political objectives. And so I think that's another really important part of the angle of they're not just using the universities, but they're actually funding them to begin with so they can use yeah, yeah, and I actually, I saw some of this in my own research too. One of the things that's unsettling about these Coke implants and the other right-wing donor implants is that, again, they're playing with the rules, right? But, and I think one of the reasons I got such a reaction to my book is that it shows that basically um, a lot of people who are getting positions in higher education wouldn't be there if it weren't for this do ideologically driven donor money. These donors create ideologically dr driven searches that lead to small pools of people who are gonna fit the mold who get a 
job because they will be part of this. And then when they're there, if they're getting Coke monies, they're expected to do things that advance the project. And so I think that freaked out a lot of people because it's like, you know, they, and these are also, I don't know, people who attack anti-discrimination measures and affirmative action and stuff. And it's like, how dare you when so many of you would not be in these positions, but for these arch uh, right donors. Yes, sir, in the back. So, um, quickly, a lot of this is the jail for me around the question of why have other groups, for example, the Democratic Party or the Socialist Party, uh, failed at e evincing, articulating, uh, powerfully putting forward in an effective way an alternative collective model. So the, there, is, there should be a balance mm -hmm. to the uh, radical individualized or atomized model, but there hasn't been so far. And then I raised a couple of points. There are an awful lot of students around here and at a lot of universities are hurrying to get really good, well-paying, high-tech jobs. Great. But they don't join unions. They don't form unions. They don't join unions in solidarity with other tech workers who aren't high-paid or high-tech or in Silicon Valley. Why is that? So that's an interesting question. Uh, and here at the university, we just had a big symposium about a driverless future. What does that mean to the teamsters? Yeah. So the, those questions are about a collective mm -hmm. beyond just the folks you know and like. Yeah. And so there is no alternative model about a collective that includes people, even people you don't know or like. Mm -hmm. So that's my point. Yeah, I think it's a really, really uh, interesting and important point. Um, I, my research was on Buchanan and this network and this idea of chaining democracy. So I wasn't trying to write a bi biography of Buchanan or a history of public choice thought. I got intrigued by this idea. And so it's kind of a biography of that idea. So I can't speak, you know, I, my research is not about the Democrats, but I know there's plenty to be said that has been said that is being said. But I think that's also part of the kind of renewal that we're talking about, but also unions. I mean, um, it, uh, there was a point um, where the Democratic Party moved away from its labor base, right? And then also tried to move away from its civil rights base. And that has helped us get where we are. That plus money in politics and the Democrats are heavily dependent on the financial sector uh, for contributions um, and Silicon Valley, which is enraptured with this idea of creative destruction as being the greatest thing on all fronts, right? And I, I don't think that makes for a very sustainable society, but that's the reality that we're in. Yes. So my question fits to that in this earlier question, which is the argument that we should maybe stop so much talking about right and left and mm -hmm. talk about the 1% versus everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I wonder to what extent Lennon <coughs> thought that he was part of a right something or not at all. And yeah. I think your point is really important. He, he actually liked to style himself a populist, and his grandfather was a populist uh, governor. There's a very interesting uh, story there um, that I tell in the book. But basically what he did was totally invert the categories of populism that he inherited from, his, so in his grandfather's day, the, the, the predators were the robber barons, the mortgage brokers, the, you know, all of these kinds of people, but Buchanan inverted it. So it's like the kind of people who were in the populist party and the fusion movement became the enemy and the, the, the corporate people uh, sort of became the, the pals. So, um, but I think the right has been very effective at that. And I think most people, because um, we don't really recognize the code, we don't realize how far it's gone, but you have like the Heritage Foundation in their mailings after Donald Trump was elected, they were saying, We've overthro we're overthrowing the ruling class. This is the language they use. We're overthrowing the ruling class. Congratulations. And to them, the ruling class is, again, you know, labor unions, as weak as they are now, civil rights groups, and establishment members of both political parties. But this is the kind of agitational language that they, they use. So it is really scary. On your point of right and left, yeah, I think I actually believe that the vast majority of Americans are really decent, good people who try to do the right thing. People are overwhelmed, they're stressed, they grow, you know, grow up with a particular set of ideas, whatever, but people are basically decent, caring people. This cause cannot go forward without in instigating and permanently agitating cultural wars to have us divide against one another. So I think that one of the things that we um, 
could be doing in this crisis is reaching out to one another with some curiosity and empathy um, and learning from one another. There's a black uh, feminist theorist named Bernice Johnson Reagan who wrote a, a brilliant uh, work about coalition building in the 1980s that's still relevant. But she said at one point, she said, if you're not feeling the strain, you're not doing the work, right? <laughs> if, it's, if you feel comfortable, you're still talking to yourselves, <laughs> you know, that you have to get out and get into these conversations and these settings where it's harder and that's where, you know, the real work of reinventing democracy will come. So I, I agree. I think, you know, these guys are not conservatives. They used to admit that they were radicals, you know, and they, Buchanan denied that he was a conservative. Hayek denied that he was a conservative. They, you know, uh, what's his name? Koch was radical in the 1970s, but when they realized they're a permanent minority and he got serious about getting power, suddenly they fly under the flag of conservatism because that's where the votes are to be had. But I think every person who is connected, especially we're in an academic setting, every academic who um, accepts Coke money, is part of this project, needs to look at themselves in the mirror and ask themselves a question. Do you support using bigotry to get people to the cult polls to move this agenda? Because that's what's happening. It, homophobia in my state, racism in others, nativism in others, you can't pretend, as they like to call themselves, that you're a classical liberal and be part of an operation that is attacking scientists, climate scientists, that is stoking racism, that is beating up on trans people and gay people. It just, it doesn't go together. And so I think we're also at a moment when a lot of us, you know, kind of have to look at who we are and who we're partners with and, and what it means to where we go forward. Um, sh uh, Okay, let's take, I, I don't think we've had um, so many student questions, so let's take you up there. Yeah. Uh, I just had a question about like, how, yeah, like, talking more about. how like uh, the, the big like, part, uh, point of the Libertarian Party to fix public, uh, fix redlining in, in public school system and school segregation would be vouchers to where people get to choose where to send their children. Uh -huh. Can you break down how exactly that, that doesn't fix an issue of segregation? The vouchers? Yeah. Oh yeah, because they're mostly applied in overwhelmingly poor minority, uh, predominantly minority schools. So it's a way of actually uh, avoiding the challenge of true desegregation in a true egalitarian agenda. You're just moving people from public schools that were, were um, students of color, poor students of color were underserved to private entities or charter uh, schools where by and large it's the same thing. I mean, there are a few charter schools that have done well, but on balance the research, at least as I have read it and understood it, shows that they're less effective than the public schools, which is interesting because it's often also parents who are the most motivated um, to, to, to try to make something work who get their kids to charter schools, but still a lot of them have been failures. So um, Helen Ladd is at Duke. Duke University and the Sanford School is one of the national leaders on this issue. You might look for her website and her reports on this. And also um, Diane Ravitch, who had been a big supporter of these things and who has really turned because she's understood that it is this right agenda that's also coming from hedge fund people are investing in this in a big way. They see that there's something called the Education Industry Investment Forum. They know that there are $800 billion, I think that's an old number too, that's several years old, but $800 billion in public monies going into schools. And they think, hmm, Look at all that money. You know, if we could put this into private, for-profit corporations, educational corporations, whoo, that's a whole new source of income, whole new field to play in. So these guys, you know, are not serious about education. I think people like Diane Ravitch um, and Pedro Noguera, who's actually a friend of mine from college, who's, who's very uh, involved in this stuff, people are starting to realize that it's just a really um, destructive agenda at this point. Can I say something about yes. the financing of the uh, A little story. She not only talks the talk, she walks the walk, okay? <laughs> about four years ago, we were working on a book manuscript for the University of Virginia Press, so we were on a timeline and we were trying to get the manuscript done. And I got a message from her that the Duke historians were going down to demonstrate at the Capitol in North Carolina and Raleigh, and we're gonna get arrested, and I wrote her back immediately. Oh, not you, of course, Nancy. And the next thing I got on my computer was a picture of Nancy being lit off in handcuffs. So she puts it, she puts it on the line. She's, uh, she's for real. So